the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Judy Rubin, chairman of the 92nd Street Y, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to the last evening of this year's About Women series, a series that is focused on the image of women in today's society. Because this topic is endlessly provocative, and because our series has been so well received this year, we will be presenting it again next year as part of our 1990-91 series. Among the distinguished academics and authors you will hear next season will be Carolyn Heilbrunn, Linda Nochlin, Camille Paglia, Marilyn Suzanne Miller, and Anna Quinlan. We hope you will join us for the second season of About Women. You will, a lot of you will, I can tell. <laughs> and now a word about this evening's format. Tonight our two guests will discuss the image of women in the theater for approximately 50 minutes, after which they will take questions directly from the audience on the topic. Tonight we could have no more articulate representatives from the world of theater than Carol Rothman and Wendy Wasserstein. And I'd like to add a personal note and say that I am particularly pleased at having been asked to introduce them, having seen and applauded a great many of Carol Rothman's productions and being a board member of Playwrights Horizons where all of Wendy Wasserstein's plays have been produced. Carol Rothman wears three theatrical hats. Try saying that several times. She is artistic director, director, and producer. She's an artistic, the artistic director and co-founder of Second Stage Theater, where she has directed Split by Michael Weller, How I Got That Story by Amlyn Gray, My Sister in This House by Wendy Kesselman, Three Plays by Tina Howe, Painting Churches, Coastal Disturb Disturbances, and Approaching Zanzibar, as well as others. She has directed plays for Circle Repertory Company, The Mark Taper Forum, and the Kennedy Center, and she has co-produced over 40 productions, including plays by Lanford Wilson, John Guare, and Steve Tessick, as well as the Broadway production of Spoils of War by Michael Weller. She is the recipient of Tony and Drama Desk nominations for her direction of Coastal Disturbances on Broadway, and in 1987, she was awarded an Obie for Sustained Excellence by a Director. Wendy Wasserstein, playwright, screenwriter, essayist, is the author of six plays produced at Playwrights Horizons, Any Woman Can't, Montpelier Pizzazz, Uncommon Women and Others, which was also produced by Public Broadcasting, Miami, and The Heidi Chronicles, now in its second year on Broadway. For Heidi, she has been awarded the Tony Award, the Pulitzer Prize, the New York Drama Critics Circle Award, and the Outer Critics Circle Award, among other prizes. A recipient of NEA and Guggenheim grants and a member of the Council of the Dramatists Guild, Wendy Wasserstein is a contribut contributing editor of New York, Women Magaz New York Woman magazine and the author of Bachelor Girls, a collection of essays rec recently published by Alfred A. Knopp and for which she has just returned from a book tour nationwide. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two distinguished guests, Please welcome them, Carol Rothman and Wendy Wasserstein. Thank you. young women directors in New York and she was one of the few young women playwrights and more recently we've become very good friends and I've always wanted to ask her deep background question Wendy why did you start writing plays <laughs> well Carol <laughs> 
Um, actually, uh, in terms of writing plays, uh, I grew up in New York, uh, in Brooklyn, and then my folks moved into Manhattan right around here, and I, I grew up taking dancing classes at the June Taylor School of the Dance. And for those of you who don't remember, the June Taylor dancers were the dancers on the Jackie Gleason show, and the legs went like this. And, uh, <laughs> and then um, afterwards, my mother and father would take me to Broadway matinees. So really the first plays I saw were Broadway musicals. And I can even remember being home and listening to the, um, the soundtrack of um, South Pacific and the lyric about you've got to be taught before it's too late, before you're six or seven or eight. And I remember being seven and thinking I've got one year left. <laughs> but what, always, what used to occur to me in those musicals, I remember as I watched them, was I never was that interested in the ingenue or the lady who got the man. I always liked her best friend, the sort of funny lady with the hat and the purse. <laughs> and I always, and somehow I was always drawn to, to those characters. And I think in a way that sort of shows in, in my later work in terms of writing comedy and stuff. But what's interesting in terms of me and the theater was how I got my first play done goes back to the June Taylor School of the Dance, which was that when I got out of Mount Holyoke, I started writing plays. I was taking playwriting classes with Israel Harvitz and fiction writing with Joe Heller. And I wrote this play called any woman can't, which happily no one in this audience has ever seen. But <laughs> anyway, my mother was walking down the street and she ran into Louise Roberts, who used to be the secretary at the June Taylor School of the Dance. And Louise asked my mother, what's Wendy doing? And my mother started hyperventilating and saying, Wendy's not a lawyer, she's not married to a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and <laughs> I think Louise, to sort of calm my mother, said, well, listen, I work at a new dancing school called the Clark Center in the Y on 52nd Street, and it's across the hall from a new theater called Playwrights Horizons. So give me Wendy's play, and I'll give it to Bob Moss. So that was really how my first play was done, which is sort of interesting, I yes, think. Yes, I think so. Well, just in terms of how plays get done, I think, are very seldom that someone puts a play in an envelope and sends it to Mike Nichols and he says, great, let's give it to Glenn Close and we're going. So. <laughs> um, over the years, uh, I've enjoyed watching Wendy's work and I've really been thrilled by her success. Her first play, um, Uncommon Women and Others, had a very brief two-week run, I think? Two and a half weeks. Yes, uh, at a non <laughs> at a nonprofit theater in New York. But her second play, Isn't It Romantic, moved to off-Broadway. And of course, her current play is on Broadway. And last year, she did win, I think, every major award except for the Heisman Trophy. Right. <laughs> um, Which I wanted. Yes. <laughs> and you deserve it. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, Wendy, was this a kind of natural process in an expanding career, or, or do you think that audiences are more receptive to plays about women now than before? Would, have, would Uncommon Women and others, if it were done now, would it have moved to Broadway? Well, that's what's interesting, because I think during the process of this time, things really have changed. I wrote Uncommon Women uh, initially when I was a graduate student at the Yale School of Drama. And it was really because we were, at the time, reading a lot of Jacobean drama. And for those of you not familiar, this is going to be a very rough sketch, but basically, a man kisses a woman and then drops dead from the poison on her lips. <laughs> and I basically thought to myself, this is not familiar to me or to any of my friends. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I decided I was going to write an all-woman's play. And I also, I wanted to write the flip side of Deliverance. Um, <laughs> So, and the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see an all-woman's curtain call in the basement of the Yale School of Drama. Very impressive. It was basically my thought, well, I'm a student here. They're going to have to sit through this no matter what happens. So I, and so when I was looking back, trying, going backwards to write an all-woman's play, I came back to Mount Holyoke in that environment. And so I wrote this play, but I'll never forget, afterwards there was an after-play discussion, as there often is in drama school, and somebody who was quite smart, actually, some guy raised his hand and said, you know, I can't get into this. It's about girls. <laughs> and I really thought, you know, I've spent my life getting into Robin Hood and Lawrence of Arabia. Why don't you try it? <laughs> it, it? It wouldn't have occurred to me 
that that would be a case. But I think that was more true at the time than now. And I know Uncommon Women ran actually at the Phoenix Theater, which was then at Marymount College in 1978, um, for two and a half weeks. We had to leave because Marymount was doing their production of the women. But it, there's a scene in Uncommon Women where one of the, Holly calls a doctor that she met once in a museum in Minneapolis, and she calls him her senior year and starts talking to him, and it's, it's I think, quite moving. But there was one person who wanted to move Uncommon Women to Broadway, but only if the last moment of the play, Holly pulled out a big diamond ring and said, guess what? <laughs> and that she had married this doctor, which I just thought it sounded crazy, so <laughs> so it didn't. But it was interesting. That was the only commercial interest in moving that play. It seemed like a special interest play, or that the audience would say, "I can't get into this. It's about girls." girls. So the leap from that to Heidi, which is you know, follows one girl, you know, and woman, is I think does show that there's there's different things have gotten better in a way. Differences. Um, Uncommon Women kind of launched the careers of many, I think, big careers of some of our friends, Meryl Streep, Jill Eikenberry, Judith Light, Susie Kurtz. Do you think that uh, women are writing the best parts for women, or do you have any desire to write a play where the man is the leading character? I think that's always a hard question, uh, in a sense. I mean, when you think about, like, Tennessee Williams's women or Chris Durang writes wonderful women, I think. I think there is, it's funny, I, in, in terms of myself, I do tend to write plays about women or about the conflicts of women, um, I guess because in some sense it's my experience or in some sense I begin to see that it's not in the literature and it drives me crazy. <laughs> so, And that's always a good reason to sit down and start writing, I think. I think so. Um, but it's interesting if you, you know, talk to Meryl Streep or Jill Eikenberry, they will, because we've all remained friends after this experience, they will call up and say, write me something. They're isn't anything. I'm looking for something. Um, I don't want to be in a car chase movie as the nice girl that they're chasing the car to. <laughs> so. Or perhaps you'll write some parts for women after they reach 40 years old. <laughs> right, right. Um, you've written a lot about your family, mm -hmm. your brother, your sisters, but especially about your mother. And I think that if any of you saw Isn't It Romantic, you know that Wendy kind of introduced a version of her mother to the theater going public. Um, what do you feel about the image of mothers <laughs> that's being projected in your writing, not in general, Wendy? Oh, just my mother. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. Well, all mothers. <laughs> go, go I was just for thinking it. about my mother's statement when she came to the opening night of Uncommon Women. <laughs> she came up to me and said, Wendy, where did you get those shoes? Why are you wearing those shoes? <laughs> and really, and all I could think of was, yes, Mrs. Lincoln, and did you like the play? <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so my mother's always been a formidable force in my life. <laughs> my shoes tonight are a little ragged, actually. I was just looking at them. Um, <laughs> it, it's interesting. Um, I think in some ways what... Let me backtrack a little to when I started the first playwriting course I took, which was actually I was studying to be a congressional intern at Mount Holyoke, and I was falling asleep on the Congressional Digest. And this friend of mine said to me, why are you doing this? Why don't you come with me and take playwriting at Smith, and then we can go shopping? So she, she basically said the magic word, and the duck came down. But, but what... What I really learned um, at Smith was, and I never knew this, that basically we all have stories to tell, and those stories are legitimate. Um, and the other thing that I learned was I used to think at that time, because that was the late 60s, that to be a woman artist or playwright, you had to have sort of pre-Raphaelite hair that flowed down your head and silver rings and shawls and Fred Braun sandals, and I certainly wasn't that. <laughs> Um, I was always a hardy type. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but what really, what I learned from that time was that stories about my friends, my mother, my stories were legitimate and were theatrical, and I had no idea that that was true. 
Um, also because maybe because so many of our mothers weren't seen on stage, it, it just wasn't there. And actually my own mother Lola is a very theatrical source. I mean there was raw material just waiting <laughs> to be used. I mean in some ways I think I'm very lucky that this woman and I cross paths. <laughs> so, because she was just there. But what's interesting about it, um, isn't it romantic, is the one of the best scenes in that play, there's two mothers in that play. There's a, a Jewish mother who is a fanatical dancer and exerciser, and um, there's the wasp mother who's a career woman, quite a successful career woman, and there's a scene in the play where the two women meet uh, on Central Park South, and in a way it's my favorite scene, although interesting in terms of constructing a play, it doesn't move the action forward at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a scene that, you know, any dramaturg could tell you, cut this scene, save the time. And all I could say was, well, this is my favorite scene. <laughs> so, um, but there's something about seeing two women of dignity meeting and the attempt to give them their dignity, I think, is what makes it work, I think, and to give and to see their different points of view meet and what they have in common. Um, and I think actually in a sense trying to write that in terms of my own mother or this other mother was an interesting thing to do and, and gratifying as well. And what was nice too was being able to cast that part because so many times, as Carol was saying before about parts for women over 40, they're very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And so it was very nice having this succession of women. And in fact, the first person we cast in Isn't It Romantic was Betty Comden who played my mother figure, which was interesting because I remember when I used to go to those musicals or look at the records, I would always look for girls' names and I had no idea who this Betty was, but I was glad she was there. You know, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> sort of interesting. I, I love the scene where, the mo uh, for me, where the mother turns to her daughter and said, I had three important things in my life and I had to make some choices. I had my husband, my children, or my career, and I could only choose two. And I thought it was interesting the choice she decided to make. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't seen the play, you won't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when I first read the Heidi Chronicles, I thought it was a play about social movements, about the failures or consequences of social movements, the peace movement of the 60s, gay rights, civil rights, all seen through the eye of feminism. I think what I've been surprised about is kind of the hue and cry about the play, which, and focusing on the central issue that your main character, Heidi, feels that she's been betrayed by the women's movement. And the last image that we're left with in the play is that she gets some kind of acceptance or peace or happiness by adopting a baby, which is not necessarily the most politically correct statement. But is this fair? Do you have any feelings about that? Gosh, uh, first of all, I think when you start dealing with plays and are they politically correct or not, you really get into trouble. Because I think you can ask if things are politically correct from the right, and you can ask if they're politically correct from the left. And it's imposing an ideology on a play. I think the thing about the Heidi Chronicles is it's one woman's story. It's Heidi's story. Um, and Heidi is someone actually who is, I think, uh, quite a good feminist in terms of what she devotes her life to, which is teaching uh, women's art. And, and what she writes about and what her passion is about. And Heidi's life is completely changed by the women's movement and by that idea. And in fact, the attempt of the Heidi Chronicles was to write one serious good person. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a scene in, um, in the lunch scene between her and her best friend Susan. And one of my favorite lines in that play is when Susan says, Heidi says, Susan, Susie, do you ever feel what makes you a person is also what keeps you from being a person? And Susie says to Heidi, you know, by now I've been so many people, I don't know who I am and I don't care. <laughs> and I find the ability to say that terrifying both to Heidi and to me. And I think what's interesting about Heidi is her center is very strong. Uh, and I think at the end of that play, she makes a choice, a choice for Heidi. It can't be, it's not every woman's 
choice, nor should it be. And it never says that in the play, nor does she ever say, you know, I have a baby now and everything's solved, whoopee. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's one woman's journey and it's one woman's choice. And for me anyway, plays are about character and they're following that character through uh, mm -hmm. one person's journey. I thought it was interesting that you decided to make her from the Midwest and not necessarily a New York woman. Was that... Well, attempt? Heidi, in a sense, is of all my characters, um, central characters, the one who is in many ways the furthest from me. Um, she may have in many ways uh, emotional feelings that are similar to mine or have been similar to mine at a time, but Heidi's an observer. She's someone who watches. That's why she's an art historian. Um, and that's why, in a sense, as a chronicler, she's someone who can pass through the time and see the t and watch all the time. And in a way, it was very deliberate to keep her away from me. Janie Blumberg in Isn't It Romantic is much closer to me. I mean, Heidi is an academic and an art historian. I'm sort of showbiz. <laughs> so I think it's uh, different. Although the seriousness of her, I would say, in some ways is close to my own seriousness when I'm serious, so. And what about the, uh, I think that you really captured the men in that play extremely well, and I think that that was part of one of the, one of the reasons you wrote it. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in fact, in terms of the Heidi Chronicles, in some ways, one of the most successful characters in that play is the gay pediatrician. And in, in many ways, and Boyd Gaines won a Tony for his, uh, for his performance of that part. And in some ways it goes back to what you said, Carol, about the play sort of paralleling movements and paralleling times and certainly the gay movement and the feminist movement and also different kinds of love, different kinds of affection and certainly the love between Heidi and the doctor and their friendship is an enormous one uh, in their life and something that when Peter turns to her and says, our friends are our families, I'm very sorry you didn't know that. I'm sorry that that doesn't mean something to you. In some ways, that's the climax of the play. Because in some ways, that says something about that generation. So one of the reasons why the last scene of the play may seem long is because, you know, in some term terminology, that's where the play lands. That's, that's the heart of it somewhere. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, did you do a lot of research um, in art history? I mean, what did, what did you look for? What, tell us something about that. I know nothing about it. And <laughs> well, that was sort of an interesting thing um, because how play, different people write plays different ways. My plays tend to go through at least five drafts before uh, they would certainly be open to a New York audience. Um, the Heidi Chronicles was done in a workshop at the Seattle Repertory Theater. And, um, and they sort of begin instinctually. Instinctively, I knew she was an art historian for whatever reason, and I knew she was an observer. But if you came, the first draft of that play didn't have the art history lectures in it. Those were written in Seattle because uh, when we were working on the play, Dan Sullivan said to me, look, you can't open this play with 35-year-olds playing 16-year-olds because people will just think we don't have the money. We can't afford the actors. <laughs> So I began writing these art history lectures, and I also wanted to show this woman uh, going back to her commitments in life as a very good teacher, and that this was what she was committed to. And then I started doing research about women in art, and began and found out that there were no women in Jansen's history of art. None? Uh, none, until like, what, 1982? Something like that, which means I didn't even ask, you know, there I was at Mount Holyoke writing down all the men's names and never thought, gee, there aren't any women being mentioned here. So I began doing some research on it, and I went down to the museum, the Women's Museum in Washington, and I began to find it all really quite fascinating. And looking into, because uh, a woman like Clara Peters, who painted in the 1500s, still lives, was a, a wonderful painter. Um, and it's interesting also when you go to the Metropolitan, some of the paintings where it says artist unknown, in fact, it means the, the painter was a woman. Uh, <laughs> so I look forward to my plays where it says writer unknown. <laughs> uh, but they'll remember the mother. Um, uh, no, there's no mother in Heidi Grimes. No, no, there is. And that's interesting in terms of 
the work of one playwright, you'll notice in the Heidi Chronicles, they never talk about her parents. They're never, they're never mentioned. And that, that was for me personally, because I felt, isn't it romantic, was so much about parents. And Heidi was not. And Heidi was ultimately about our friends or our families. So it was going someplace else. But you had an image for Heidi's mother, really, truly. Really, truly. <laughs> Very nice. Um, nice shoes. <laughs> Uh, do you feel, do you ever feel ghettoized as a woman playwright? I mean, I don't think that, after all, I don't think people really mention David Mamet or Michael Weller or Jules Pfeiffer as being male playwrights. Well, that's, yes, I always, it, that, that's always occurred to me. They, they'll always, you know, in a play of mine or Marsha Norman's or Tina's or, you know, anyone, they'll always say, are you a feminist? What are your feelings about women? And a part of me wishes to God they'd ask David Mamet. I'd like to know. <laughs> I would like, youth wants to know. Um, <laughs> In a sense, um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question, and it's one that I've sort of changed my answer on through the years. I mean, in a way, it's like, are you a woman playwright? Well, yes, I am a woman, and I'm a playwright. I can't say that I'm not. And um, actually, now I would say, yes, I'm a feminist playwright as well. Um, I think, to what scares me is the sort of thing like a theater will plan its season and they'll do one woman's play and one play by, you know, an Afro-American writer and the rest will do, the rest will be plays. Yeah. And guess who wrote those? <laughs> so it's, it's very, one hopes to get to a point where, you know, maybe we'll do, you know, in a season like at the second stage, frankly, where you do, you know, plays by women, plays by men. There are women directors, male directors, or in, um, in Louisville this year in their new, New Plays Festival, I think they did 11 plays by women and one by a man. So what you don't want to do is get into that slot, or we'll do our woman's play. I, th I think that's, that's bad. And I also think that the question that your play, going again back to correct thinking, that your play has to say the correct thing about women because you are the woman playwright, you must stand for all women, that's a big burden to put on a play and to put on an artist as well. Yes, I don't really think you write with your ovaries. Do no. You? <laughs> time um, to time, when things get slow. <laughs> but do you think that it's affected your writing in any way? I mean, I know that I sometimes become very sensitive to that issue. You know, oh, there's the woman director. And I get asked to be on panels or something like that, just as the token woman or the only woman. Are you, I know that recently because of your recent successes and because you're so much in the public eye that you've been asked to be on a lot of panels. Do you feel that it's because you're a woman or do you feel, or do you feel confident now that it's because you're a great playwright? Gosh, uh, <laughs> or it's two mints in one. Um, I don't. Um, it, I don't know. I mean, a lot of times you do feel like, why was I invited here? It's because I am the woman. Um, and really what you don't want is that means next year there'll be another woman and then it'll be a woman, as opposed to seeing three women and two men or, or whatever that is. And then your point of, you're always being asked that point of view. And, you know, sometimes you have an answer and sometimes you don't. But I, what I really do think is important is that these questions be asked, they're important questions, but they also be asked truly of men as well, because it's important. Why, in other words, if one is talking about the ending of Heidi, and is that correct, or what do we think, and having a dialogue about it, which is what plays are for, to have dialogues, then one also has to talk about the character of Madonna and Speed the Plow. Talk about that woman, what is being said about that woman. Um, I think it's very important to lift this subject up, in a way, because it is a very important subject. Yes, I know that we've talked, I think we talked about two or three years ago, uh, nobody was saying that there weren't any plays by women on Broadway, and, and in fact there weren't, but nobody was mentioning it. And I said to Wendy, I said, do something about it. Let's write an article for the Times. No, and actually it was because of these conversations with Carol, I said, well, I'm going to go home and write a play. Um, because I thought one can get angry, or if one can write, go home and write it. Um, because I was feeling, again, I began sort of talking to friends and not seeing these images images of uh, women being portrayed. So, I think so. <clears throat> well, now let's see, you went to a women's college and your 
and Uncommon Women was about a woman at a woman's college. And then you moved to New York, and Isn't It Romantic was about a woman who moved to New York. And <laughs> Heidi Chronicles was a play about a woman living in New York and dealing with the issues of the 80s. Are we to look forward to your next play being about a woman in the 90s who gains wealth and fame, or... Oh, God. I, I mean, I know, know your plays aren't strictly <laughs> autobiographical, but are there... Are you distilling what's happening now, thinking about that? I don't know. You know, I wish I could give you a quick answer and say it will be about, I don't know what, kangaroos in Australia. <laughs> um, in a sense, I mean, I, in the midst of this all, I wrote a musical called Miami that was done five years ago that didn't, it was done in a workshop that didn't really work, but it was about um, a 16-year-old boy and his sister in Miami Beach in 1959, which I actually was very fond of. I was too. See, Carol liked it. So, um, so I think one tries to do different things and one tries to grow in different ways. Um, I, I do tend to write out of personal experience or out of what I'm hearing around me or what I find is being said or what's making me sad or something like that. I mean, a play is a long time commitment. For me, it takes two years to write a play. So in a sense, it's gotta be something that interests me long enough to stick with it. Um, I have a feeling uh, the play that I'm gonna next write will uh, in some ways again be about women, although relationships in, in some way. It's, it's hard to talk about a new work a little bit because it's so nascent. And also it's, you know, I always think that, so when I took uh, uh, fiction writing with Joe Heller, he once told me that you have to be able to condense your work, like the, he said, Wendy, the ancient mariner is about a man who shot a bird. And, <laughs> and I, I've always been, I always wish that I could get my plays down to that, in a sense. But in another way, it always feels like high concept. In a way, it feels like Hollywood. It makes me think like, you know, I'd go into a movie meeting and say, say, I've got a great idea. It's about a feminist art historian who becomes sad. Mm -hmm. Terrific. <laughs> great idea. Um, so, I, you know, that's, it's hard to say specifically. But are there is. ideas floating around in your mind? Are there things, not necessarily about your next play, but things that are, have been on your mind about the future or what you're seeing now because you know Heidi Chronicles was so clear about um, what was going on. I think so. I think in, if, in, in anything what I would try to do is things that are more complicated in, in a way what Heidi began but maybe deeper sort of paralleling personal lives versus political lives and social change and how one's external life uh, somehow affects one's internal life. I think also as one you know, I, I would write about people, older people, you're dealing with mortality, things mm -hmm. like that, happy things like that. <laughs> Another comedy. <laughs> um, and I think also uh, what I've tried to do in my plays is a, a little bit the balance of comedy and what is a serious play, because I think in many ways we sort of divide them and say, here are serious plays and here are comedies, and comedies are farces, and you know, people are running around in garter belts and rolling around, <laughs> or it's sort of a laugh a minute, and then there are serious plays on serious subject, and in fact, if you go back and look at Chekhov or whatever, the cherry orchard is called a comedy, and the attempt, my attempt would be to try to do both on some level, to write serious plays which happen to be comedic. Well, I would hope so. That's a, <laughs> that would be enjoyable. Yeah. Um, do, would you write plays about issues or about characters? I tend to write it from character. I mean, I think the Heidi Chronicles is a lot about a lot of issues, but it began with the character. It began with this woman uh, and uh, her journey. But it was, for me, I always begin with two characters talking and find out who they are, and then take them to the places I want to take them to. And it often, it comes from just an image. I know, you know, maybe in a sense, I mean, Uncommon Women, the idea of an all-woman's curtain call in the basement of the Yale School of Drama was an idea, or the flip side of deliverance was an idea. But what I had to do was find the character first. Uh, and then be able to move towards the idea. Um, with the Heidi Chronicles, I always knew I was going towards that speech, uh, that I wanted to start with this sort of happy, you know, basically smart, dignified person and go moving somehow towards that speech. But I, I had to find her first, I think. And in Common Women, did you like find all of them or was it just one character? Or did you 
Did you have a sense of who they all were? Mm, uh, as I got more and more into writing it or finding them more, I did. And also, sometimes in my plays, I tend to divide myself. In Uncommon Women, especially, one tends to divide themselves up into eight different parts. So I got to be the house mother and the catatonic and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> That's good. What about your screenwriting? I know that you're, I mean, do you want to discuss it? But I think that you're doing some of that, translating some of your plays onto the screen. Is that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to write the Heidi Chronicles as, as a screenplay. Um, that's interesting in terms of screenplays and women. Uh, Isn't it romantic as a screenplay that I wrote like seven years ago that has sort of passed through the various studios? And it's always because it's a relation play or because it's with mothers, it tends to be called soft. Whereas what's you know powerful and hard is sort of the police car chases. In fact, I was in L.A. two weeks ago on my book tour because I adapted a, a novel called The Object of My Affection, which is a lovely novel, actually, that may actually get filmed in the fall. But what they were telling me is, you know, it's very hard to do movies with female lead characters because who's really big at the box office are the cowboys. Uh, and that's really scary. Or if you, you know, if Meryl Streep was here, she'd tell you about how much more money male stars make than female stars because it's the cowboys at the box office. And I, I don't know. I always think these things are not true unless you have to change them. They're proven otherwise. It's just like a play with a woman character can run on Broadway and people will come and it can run for the year, a year and win the Tony. It just has to be done on some level. And, and are you doing it? Uh, I'm resting a little, but <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, uh, in some ways, well, I'm going to, you know, in terms of Heidi, I'll try to write it the best I can, but um, in terms of screenplays and stuff, I, I, I really see myself as a, primarily a playwright. I think because in the theater, again, what interests me is character and language, and also the playwright has control. Uh, when you write movies, you know, there can be 12 different writers of Tootsie. Who knows what happens? I mean, in the movies, I, I could write, you know, the Heidi Chronicles, and they could decide, gee, it was a good idea two years ago, but it's not so good now, and Julia Roberts is really hot. Let's change this and make it about a 19-year-old, and, you know, who knows what they would do? So in some ways, um, I'm, I'm very committed to the theater. What about your, your new book? Oh, Bachelor Girls. Bachelor Girls. <laughs> uh, that's a, a collection of essays from a column that I write for New York Woman. Um, and that's really, I mean, writing essays is very different than writing plays because those are from a personal point of view. Those are always from the I point of view. And in, in some ways, they are things that I couldn't see making, you know, spending two years on you know, a play about manicures, but... <laughs> An important subject, I think. It's, it's certainly doable as, uh, as an essay. Um, there's also an essay about my mother in there as my mother, as opposed to transformed into another character. And there's also, uh, my favorite essay in there is one called Jean Harlow's Wedding Night, uh, which, is <laughs> which is about being funny and what it's like to be a funny woman in some ways and where that comes from and what about it is ingratiating and what about it is a way of distancing. And I, th I think that's sort of interesting too. How does your family feel when they read about themselves in these essays or books? <laughs> <laughs> Their lives flashed my, across the uh, My mother came to Isn't It Romantic the first time it was done at the Phoenix and said that woman isn't a dancer, I am a dancer. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean in some ways I, th I do think that territory in many ways, from my point of view, has been <laughs> plumbed. Um, <laughs> so um, I think they're looking forward to me moving on to other things. <laughs> How about a play about your sister? Uh, yes, well, that I'm saving them. Uh. <laughs> but they're out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't think I so, have any more questions. No, you um, want to take questions? Should from... we take questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, I'd love to know how you uh, go about the technical aspects of writing your plays. The, uh, for instance, Uncommon Woman, uh, Woman was extremely complicated in its uh, design, its complexity. When you sit down with a piece of paper, where do you start? Let me just repeat the question. Did ever, could everybody hear that? 
Oh, he was asking technically how you write a play when you sit down with a piece of paper. How do you start it's a, in a complicated play? Gosh, well, for me, honestly, it always starts with two people talking and seeing if they've got something to say. I'm not very good visually. I'll never forget when I wrote the Heidi Chronicles and I first gave it to a director, there's a scene that takes place outside the Chicago Art Institute in the rain. And the director, Dan Sullivan, looked at this and said to me, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> How am I going to do this? And I said, it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not too good on visualization, which is probably one of the reasons also that, I mean, screenwriting is so much about the visuals. Um, I think you sort of write the play as you want to. I mean, that's what gives you the greatest freedom. And then once you're finished with it, you give it to a director like Carol and talk about it. And she could say to you, look, this is going to be absolutely impossible. We can't do this either on our stage or on our budget or it doesn't work for the play. Uh, or she'd say, you know, look, we, I think we can try and do it. And then you, you know, start dealing with the set designer. Set design can, the thing about plays as opposed to novels is they're about being produced. Um, I remember at drama school, they used to teach us about the first woman dramatist, who was a woman named Heroes Vita of Gaversham, who, who was an 8th century canonist, who was called a closet dramatist, because she wrote 800 plays that were never produced. <laughs> and I, I always thought, why are you telling me this? <laughs> <laughs> this is really sad. So what you really don't want in life is to go, you know, try to become a Rose Vita. Um, so you, you know, ultimately, you think about the play to get it produced. Um, I remember when Isn't It Romantic was first done, it was done at the Phoenix Theater on a set of five couches. And did you see that at the Phoenix? Uh, yes, I did. I saw it on the day that, that it rained. On oh, the stage. yes, the rain came down on stage one day. Uh, the asbestos curtain went off. But um, what happened, yeah, and we had these guys called carpet magic or something, vacuuming. It was everything that could go wrong basically happened that day. Um, but basically, people sat and talked to each other. And when Walter Kerr came to review the play, he said, this woman should basically be a novelist and not a playwright because people just sit and talk, there's no action. So I went and rewrote, not only did I rewrite the play, but we did an updated production of it at Playwrights Horizons where people practically never sat down. <laughs> we just kept them moving up. <laughs> and, and then um, Kerr came back and reviewed the play and he said, oh, it's so wonderful, it's so different. You know, The play was rewritten, but in fact his favorite scene was one that was not. Uh, in fact, it, and his favorite scene was the scene between the two mothers who, who walked the whole time, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so it, it's very important to think about the visualization, but really what you want to do is write the play you want to write and then work with a really good director. You know, work with Carol, work with Dan Sullivan, someone who's going to talk to you and get the best sort of deal with the play that you've written, but then deal with how are we going to get this play up and on. And that's, you know, where the collaboration really begins, I think. Any other questions? Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when did you mention the, or the, it was mentioned that uh, you were a recipient of an NEA grant. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if both of you could comment a little bit on the situation now with uh, uh, the Jesse Helms inspired uh, amendment. The question is about the NEA. Um, Wendy received a, a, an NEA grant. How does she feel about what's happening with the NEA right now? I, I think this is all terrifying. I, I can't tell you how sad this makes me. Um, the NEA is vitally important to the arts in this country and in this city. The Heidi Chronicles was produced at a theater that receives NEA grants. Uh, all my plays have been produced at theaters that received NEA grants. Isn't It Romantic was written on an NEA grant for $13,000. It might not sound much you know, to a lawyer or whatever, but to a playwright, it's a living basically. I think the censorship, uh, what Jesse Helms is doing is terrifying because it affects free speech and it also affects the arts and culture in this country. Uh, and goodness, I would be willing to speak to anyone about this. I, th I think it's a crucially important issue. Well, what do you think? I agree with you. Carol agrees. 
But, you know, when you look at um, Driving Miss Daisy was written at a play with, that was funded by the NEA. All, all of August Wilson's plays have been produced at, by theaters that have been funded by the NEA. Theater in this country, plays are developed by not-for-profit theaters that are funded by the NEA. They are not developed by commercial producers. That is no longer how things happen anymore here. And I think it will... I know, in terms of the theater, if the NEA is gone, it will crush the theater. If playwrights have to sign affidavits that say, I will only write a certain kind of play, then you're talking about not only crushing the theater, but you're crushing the individual voice. Uh, I think that we have to, well, we, we're not in that position right now because the NEA hasn't given us money uh, right now. But, and we won't really know until it's reauthorized. And we don't even know at this moment if it's going to be reauthorized. So I, I know that my partner is very busy collecting names, asking people to write letters to their congressmen. It's been like about 400 to 1 on the other side to not reauthorize the NEA. And I think that probably people have been relatively passive about it. And there was a big rally today to try and garner some support, not just in New York, where it's pretty expected that people are going to be in favor of the arts or culture, but really across the country. And I think that that's probably where the battle will be and where we'll have to take it in the future, or, or right now, actually. <laughs> An artistic decision right on the spot. Well, Wendy! <laughs> Actually, that's up to Wendy, because uh, Wendy wants to rewrite it. It was a musical. I'm not so sure she wants to keep it a musical. We've talked about it, and it's a wonderful play, a very funny, moving play about a brother and a sister and uh, that takes place in Miami. I, I think it's great. I don't know if, if Wendy has the inclination to go back to it. Sometimes playwrights, I think, don't want to go back. Um, Wendy may want to move on, but it's, it's in her drawer, and I think it's in her mind. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a matter of going back and looking at it again and sort of, sort of keeping away from the production of, of what happened to it and being clear-headed enough to move forward with it and try to figure it out. But there were very lovely things in it. Um, it starred Fisher Stevens uh, was in it and Phyllis Newman. I knew we were in trouble when one night Phyllis didn't come and I went on for her. And I, <laughs> and I thought, it's just with something, the stars, this is it. <laughs> we are not in the right configuration here. And then I got a letter from Equity saying, you have to join Actors Equity if you're going to go on. So, uh, that, I mean, Miami, it was just one of those things. We were on a roll and it was the wrong roll. <laughs> So, <laughs> although I was insulted, they didn't ask me to go replace Phyllis when she was in Brighton Beach. <laughs> so. Other questions? Yes. And the question is, how would she feel about turning Heidi Chronicles or Isn't It Romantic into a musical? It's funny because uh, both of those plays use music a great deal. Uh, especially, I mean, the Heidi Chronicles, whoever wrote the Shoop Shoop song thinks I'm the Wells Fargo truck. Uh, <laughs> they haven't been so excited in years because <laughs> you have to pay residuals to the writers of Shoop Shoop. Um, um, but it, it's interesting because I... Um, I can tell from those plays that actually my earliest knowledge of the theater was for musicals, especially isn't it romantic, and in many ways it's uh, produced like a musical. Uh, it has the sort of structure of a musical, and the opening scene is two gals on the town. It's like out of a Comden and Green musical. So in some ways I would think about it, although what I learned from Miami is when you write a musical, you have to write very sparsely. So what you do is you get to write hello, hello, gee, this is some enchanted evening, yes, and you might meet a stranger. Then what's, what's left of your script is hello, hello, and they get the song. So you have to be quite generous. Though so I'm interested in writing musicals, and I know it's, it's an unbelievably difficult process, really, really hard, and always, when there's problem, they always blame the book. 
Uh, that's the first thing to go. And I don't know whether it's because it's harder to write a new song or harder to find a new choreographer or whatever, uh, but it's, it's a really hard thing to do. Way in the back. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? Was there, does Wendy watch television and is there any good writing on television? And what's her personal life like? <laughs> you know, I always feel that I don't watch enough television. Um, I, because I, I don't watch that much television actually. I tend to talk on the phone a lot. Um, I love the telephone. Um, so, and in fact, I love the telephone so much, I don't understand how people can watch television and talk on the phone. I like to give the phone my full attention. Um, so, I, I think that th there is very good writing for television now, and actually a lot of it is being written by women and produced by women as well, designing women, Murphy Brown, the, Suzanne Harris, what's her name, Linda Bloodworth Thompson, those people are extremely talented. And it, it's also always interests me what leads one to write for what medium, why, you know, whether it's because you saw plays as a, you know, after dancing school that I would write for the theater and I don't, I didn't land up writing for television. But I think that there is very good writing for television. There's also not such good writing for television. I think when an artist is respected uh, and has a good producer, someone like Jim Brooks or Norman Lear and says, all right, here's a show, go, go with it. We believe in your voice. We believe in what you're trying to do. But often what happens with television is there's so many cooks that the broth just sort of goes and you don't know whose show it is. And when that happens, uh, you know, when it's rewritten, 26 times and you don't know who's responsible, it becomes weak. Or when it's idea of the week, that it, it can become quite weak. But I think some of it is, is really very good um, and extremely well-structured. Uh, yes? Well, you know what's funny? The Heidi Chronicles just well, the, opened. The question, is, the question is, why was it named Heidi Chronicles? Did it have anything to do with the character of Heidi in the book, or how did she choose to do that? Um, the Heidi Chronicles just opened in Stuttgart, in Germany, and I have this terrible fear of parents <laughs> bringing their children to see the little girl in Lederhosen. <laughs> That's just really <laughs> horrifying thought. Um, I often in my plays use names of friends just as a tip of the hat to friends. Uh, Dr. Patron, the gay pediatrician in my play, my roommate at Mount Holyoke was Mary Jane Patron. Uh, Heidi is an old friend of mine, Heidi Landisman, the set designer at Yale Drama School. And it's something, it's just a personal thing. It has nothing to do with the characters. And then actually I wanted, I can't think of the word diminutive name, like a Janie or a Holly or a Wendy or a Candy. And you know, one of those names that you I like to pretend that my real name is Gwendolyn, but it's not. It's Wendy for life. So I think, you know, similar thing with Heidi. That's just her name. Um, so I wanted to do that because it was taking her from a girl to being a woman. So, and then what I found is as I was looking at the book of Heidi, because I actually remembered the movie and had no idea of the book, um, I noticed that the book was divided into two parts. It was Heidi's years of travel and learning, and then the second part is Heidi uses what she knows. And so the, the, um, the play, the Heidi Chronicles, the two acts are sort of divided into that. And so the first act is, is her years of travel and learning, and then the second act is she uses what she knows. Um, so in that way, it's kind of paralleled. But it has really nothing. At the end, of, in one of the scenes, I guess in the hospital scenes, he says, your name is Heidi. Are you from the Alps? Because I thought, boy, I better make a reference to this book. I have no, <laughs> better do something with it. Uh, so that's why. I guess the question is, what's the future of theater in New York? Wendy? Oh, Carol. <laughs> you don't want to talk first? <laughs> Go ahead. I am. Um, the future of theater in New York. 
Um, well, actually, I mean, one thing that worries me is this NEA issue. That's really, really scary in terms of funding our best theaters, uh, Playwrights Horizons, Public Theater, Manhattan Theater Club. I mean, the, all of that's quite scary. In terms of theater in New York, what I can tell you as a playwright, there's wonderful playwriting going on wonderful playwriting, um, and that playwrights, what you read in uh, the newspaper about playwrights leaving the theater and going off to Hollywood because everybody wants to write for 30-something and they've all become screenwriters, isn't true. P writers will come back to the theater consistently because it is the arena of the in individual voice. It is where the writer has control, and I see this again and again. It's extremely hard. I mean, there are a lot of things that are difficult about doing plays in New York, uh, starting from the economics of it, uh, the casting of it, as we one of the hard things now, as Carol can uh, confirm, is it's very hard to cast a play, especially during the dreaded pilot season. Pilot season, <laughs> which I used to make jokes about aviation school, um, has to do with when they're making new pilots in L.A. And all the actors from New York go off to L.A. for pilot season. And it's very hard to find someone to do a play. That That's hard, and that... In our country, the, th the world is split between New York actors and L.A. actors, and only the most successful ones go back and forth. That's why in, um, in England, in London, they have both the television industry and the theater industry. So you'll find an Ian McKellen doing Shakespeare at night and uh, a show during a TV show during the day. That doesn't happen so much here, and so that makes that's a difficulty, I think. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, there's also, in terms of New York, there's uh, the critical establishment and how does a play run in terms of reviews and all of that. Um, most plays I know of now don't start in New York City. Uh, most playwrights I know, like me, taking the Heidi Chronicles to Seattle, start other places. They, they come back consistently to their homes, just as, you know, Playwrights Horizons has given me and Chris Durang and Alfred Urey and Pete Gurney a home, or Carol's Theatre has given Tina Howe and Michael Weller a home, and they will consistently come back to these theaters that nurture them, but many, many of these plays start out of town, I think. What do you think, Carol? Well, Wendy, um... I find that uh, as a theater producer, I'm just inundated with material from extremely talented writers, which is, ex which is very encouraging to me. We have a, we're looking forward to a season next year. We have just tons and tons of plays that we want to do. And I guess the problem is always, you know, finding the money to do it. I don't think that, I don't think that there's a dearth of talent. I, I do think that there's a, extremely difficult problem in casting plays because I don't think that we can actually pay a living wage to so many of the artists that work for us and, and that makes me sad and I think that we're finding a funding problem not just from the NEA but I think in general in the funding community a lot of people are, are taking their funds out of the arts and moving them into other places and we're always looking for the public sector the individuals like yourselves to help us support the theater and uh, but I don't I don't have a pessimistic view I don't know what the future is going to be I expect we're going to be hearing some new voices we're spending some time listening to some performance artists seeing how they're moving into the mainstream we had this wonderful woman who was a performance artist who used to do plays on rooftops and the people would dress in pink and she'd paint the whole roof pink and everybody would be in pink and then we got her into writing plays and she wrote wonderful plays and then she went to Hollywood just as a lark and now she's writing for my two dads. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know, I, I think that there are plenty of, <laughs> it was a strange journey but it's not an un <laughs> unusual one. And, uh, but I think, that, uh, I think that we'll be hearing voices in that direction. I, I just see tons of young people coming to New York. I don't know how they can support themselves, but they find a way. And uh, I hear wonderful new women's voices. We're doing a play right now by a woman who's you know, not exactly young, but this is her first play in New York. And, and we're, you know, it, it's very exciting to see her grow and change in what she's learning. And we're going to do another play by a young woman right after this one. So we're just really trying to, you know, stimulate everybody's juices. And I think that there's a lot of people to be stimulated and a lot of talent. I can't say where I think Broadway's going, um, but it's been a good season and there have been a lot of plays that people see. So I'm optimistic in that 
in that way too. I also think in terms of New York, I mean, there are wonderful regional theaters around this country, but in terms of, you know, there, I can't think of another city with as many good theaters in it in New York, as many plays that one could see uh, in one night in such a variety as well. And in that way, I mean, in terms of being a playwright, I still can't think of another city I would want to live in or work in or is as exciting or a place where I think, gee, I've finished this play, I want to bring it to a theater and get it read. Uh, it's still the most artistically stimulating place for a playwright, I think. And uh, that's good. The question is, does Wendy go to the theater? <laughs> when I'm not on the phone, I go. Um, yes, uh, one, because I love plays. I, lo I love being in theaters. I, I like them. I like how dark they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the other thing is that, you see, because plays have to be produced, you have to keep going to plays because what you want to see are other actors, other directors, other set designers. So if I go to Carol's play and I think, gee, that woman is good, I've written a play, we could use someone like that, I wouldn't know about that unless I went to see the play. And then also you get you know, inspired by other people's work, because it may well be. I was telling Carol, the play that most inspired the Heidi Chronicles was a play by David Edgar called May Days that I saw at the RSC that was this huge play about the history of May Days that you would never think affected the Heidi Chronicles. It's just completely different. Um, but it did actually have a, I, I thought about it a lot. So I think, no, because so much of uh, the theater is about it being inspired and also the production and, and who did it and how did they do it. Way back there. You. I think the question is, uh, what about women in the theater who want to work in more non-traditional fields like stage management or technical theater? Is there any, have there been any problems, any, uh, um, I guess I could say, I, I, I have a ton of women friends that are stage managers. I have wonderful, you know, lighting designers and set designers that are women that are working in the theater. I haven't. I know our friend Heidi does say that there's um, a lot of problems working with the union guys when you're a set designer, and that she's felt certainly that it's it's been a, a problem for her. Um, actually, in terms of stage management, seems to me one of the places where it, actually there are quite a few women stage managers. It's interesting about the Heidi Chronicles. When we first started, there were two. There was Roy Harris and a girl named Mary Fran Luftus, uh, who did it, who was an intern at Playwrights Horizons and had risen to the. I think she was the. ASM, and then we took her to Broadway with us through, you know, the producers saying, we don't know, this girl, blah, 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 blah. But she came with us, and then around two months ago, she had stayed with the play on Broadway, and now she got a job at Les Mis. And um, it was interesting. I was thinking about plays also and how they have lives of their own and whose life they affected. And there's Mary Fran Luftus, who's now, you know, at Les Mis at this incredibly uh, difficult job. And in a sense, I... Uh, I see that there's a whole history of, of women in stage management. What I think Heidi's right about uh, set designers in that case, especially I think on Broadway, it's more difficult. I think when, once you start dealing with those unions and stuff, I think you, there is some difficulty there. Was I nuts? Sure, you said. You were furiously scribbling notes. Uh huh.
Did you see the play before it opened? I think the question is, do you continue to make changes in your play, fine tune it once it's opened? Gosh, um, I make a lot of changes in my plays during previews, especially because if you write comedies, and frankly, you're the only one who's laughing at the play, <laughs> there's a problem with it. <laughs> So you have to, you know, um, I often fix, also my plays are always too long. If you come to the first night of a play of mine, they tend to be three hours and 15 minutes long. Uh, they're really sort of hard to sit through um, by the end. Um, so I, I change a lot in my plays during previews. If you saw me f furiously scribbling in the midst, it has to do with cast changes that someone new has gone into the play. Because, as we said before, it's very hard to find someone who's going to make that long a commitment. I mean, we've already had three Heidi's in my play. So one tends to, and plays, plays are a live art form. So you have to keep going back and keeping it in some sort of shape. You know, and uh, it's funny, my father, when I was growing up, my father owned a velveteen factory, and I remember him always going down, down to the factory, and sometimes I think about, I've sort of, I look at things as a velveteen <laughs> factory in a way, or you just go down, because you have to keep the play in shape. So I tend not to rewrite once the play has opened, though. I mean, finally, once it's open, it's time to go, uh, because it's already been through five drafts. I couldn't bear to rewrite it one more time. Uh, but so I think what you saw me scribbling was probably about a cast change. Way back there. The dancing, the first dancing? Gosh, uh, no, those chain, those play, those, mm, th those scenes <laughs> stayed the same. The, the script of those, the play pretty much stayed the same. Uh, there was some uh, blocking changed for Broadway. Actually, what's interesting is when the play was off Broadway and we were talking about moving the play, I wanted to stay off Broadway. I was very scared of moving the play and it was the director and the set designer said to me, no, this is going to work better in a bigger space. And they were right. Uh, and most plays that are developed in New York are developed in small spaces. And so I really wasn't familiar with how a play of mine would work on a big space. I had no idea, but they were quite correct. Uh, especially that consciousness raising scene, I think needs the space of it uh, and works better. So you, you, I agree with you. Uh. I'm an actress, one who does not go to LA. <laughs> Uh, the question is, any advice for a young woman actress? Carol? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. There's always 25 women for every part and maybe six men. And I don't think there's anything that can be done about it. That's just the way it is. I, I can't imagine what the advice I could give you would be except to you know stick it out. I don't think that situation is going to change. Maybe as we have more women writing plays for more women and more women producing plays by women, that, that will start to change. You know, there are more and more women producers and more and more women running regional theaters, and I think that this problem is gra you know will gradually change. I always react well to actors who come into the room and say, "I loved your play." <laughs> <laughs> I. I do you, I always think that person is very talented and smart. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, I can tell you a little bit about comic acting, um, which is I always am impressed with the person who does the part, who plays the character, not somebody who tries to make it funny. Uh, it, 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 someone who deals with the script, to me, is always the most impressive, not the person who brings in five props in order to make it better. 
uh, someone who can deal with what's there and seems to understand the text uh, it, from the author's point of view. I, you know, I don't know from a director's point of view, but that's, for me, that means a lot. Um, The question is, is there anything in college that inspired your writing? A class, a person? Well, a lot of it was actually this playwriting class that I took at Smith in order to go shopping. Um, this, this guy, Len Berkman, who still teaches there, was a wonderful teacher because he, I, as I said, he was the person who made me think that what I had to say was of value. And that whole idea of individual voices and that those voices, what it, what you, that one had a story to tell and it didn't have to be somebody else's story, it was your story and that, that really made a huge impression on me. And later on, I think when I was at drama school, what made the most impression on me was my classmates' plays. I'm very close to the writer Chris Durang, who was a, a he was two years ahead of me at Yale, but I just thought his plays were wonderful. They were so bright and brilliant, and I, I think just that one was able to do on a stage those kinds of things uh, made me very excited. I think when you see work that you respect and you like, it, it, it's very stimulating. And if you can find a teacher who gets the best out of you rather than imposing their theories of drama on you, because that can be awful, um, I think that that's really helpful. The question, I think the question is how she found out she won the Pulitzer Prize and was she so excited could she stand it? Well, I mean, <laughs> I was startled. I mean, because you always hear gossip in the theater and I had heard gossip like a month before that I wasn't. So, you know, I thought I'm not even going to think of, I mean, who sits around thinking I'm going to win the Pulitzer Prize? I mean, you don't. So I was actually home. I was in a Lance nightgown and I was writing an article. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, like, you know, like a graduate student. I was in a Lance nightgown and I was writing an article about my mother for New York Woman. And um, the press representative from the Heidi Chronicles, Mark Thibodeau, called me at home and said, hello, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And I said, don't be funny. And he kept telling me, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And I said, don't joke with me, that's not funny. And he kept insisting that I won this. So finally I, I said, oh, all right. And he said, well, you have to call the AP and you really should call your mother. <laughs> So I did, but I must say I was just flabbergasted. I mean, truly flabbergasted, because I'm, I'm not a very pretentious person. I, I'd never thought that, you know, that would happen. And what did so, your mother say? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I... I told her to call my brother. I just, but then she did call all my aunts and stuff and told them I won the Nobel Prize because... Really, my cousins started calling my sister and saying, when's Wendy going to Stockholm? So, but uh, it came as a... Compl it was great. It was really... Well, that was a very happy day for me. Really happy. I guess the question is, as Wendy was becoming more successful, were men threatened by her success or were they encouraging? In my personal life or my professional life? Both? I don't know. Uh, I mean, my, in terms of my professional life, my plays, I've been involved in a theater that's, you know, uh, the artistic director has been, Andre Bishop is a man, and I'm, uh, one of my closest mentors is uh, um, Lloyd Richards. Uh, from the O'Neill Foundation, uh, who directs August Wilson's plays, who was uh, enormously, in terms of inspiring to me. So, n not in terms of my work, no. Um, may, at the Yale School of Drama, yes, I think taking a woman seriously or taking someone who wrote plays about women or girlish things. Uh, but, and in terms of personally, in terms of my personal life, 
gosh, I don't, I've been asked this question before <laughs> and I don't know what to say. I'll say no, but. It's <laughs> a good answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's influencing what's being done? This is a question about a lot of major corporations pouring some money into the arts and, and, and what do we feel about it? Oh, it makes me very nervous. It really does. I, I went to the circus with my son, the Moscow Circus, and American, I hope no one hears from American Express, but American Express was the sponsor of it. And I tell you, they had American Express emblazoned across their chest and on their forehead and on the blocks that they were juggling. And I just thought it was, it was like overkill for me. I didn't need American Express at that particular point. And I know that as, government funding is dropping, we're more and more dependent on corporations and they want their name on everything. And it's a marketing tool to a great extent. There are some corporations that give you money out of the goodness of their heart, but, but primarily they want their name out there. It's just like putting an advertisement in a newspaper. And some of them actually even want to see the scripts ahead of time and they make a judgment about which are the best scripts and which are the scripts that should you know get their funding and i i think that's the wave of the future unfortunately i just think that you know theater is going to be another you know commercial venture for them and i i don't know at one point we said well let's not take this money from these people but we, we can't afford not to i don't know if wendy if you feel that way um, the Heidi Chronicles was partially uh, written and produced. There was a grant, there's, a, there's a, something called the Fund for New American Plays, which you guys also oh, got right. for Michael Weller's play, and uh, which helps small theaters. It's a, what, $50,000? It depends. Yeah, it depends. It, it, depends. it helps them do plays that are larger plays. And also it goes, there's a grant of $10,000, I think, that goes to the playwright, which was how I spent my summer rewriting the Heidi Chronicles. Um, so I'm very indebted to that. It's also a grant that the theater has to pay back. Um, so um, Playwrights Horizons is paying that amount of money back. So in a sense, it comes out as a loan. But I know that you know, in a time where arts funding is being cut, these theaters, in order to survive and in order to produce on a high level, need funding. Uh, I think, you know, in some ways, yes, it is scary, but in some, and, and in other ways, it is completely necessary. At, and I can tell you as a, as a recipient of that grant, it's so interesting how little money it takes to make a difference to, to have a, a writer write a play. I wrote the Heidi Chronicles on two grants. One was from the British American Arts Association, and it was a grant for mid-career stimulation, <laughs> which I thought sounded lewd, but... <laughs> I took it, uh, and uh, it was a grant for like $6,000 to live in London in this rooming house, basically, and go to theater and write, and then I had this other thing, and it's, you, when you think about, you know, in terms of what corporations spend their money on, or what, you know, salaries and this and that, it's, it's amazing what can come out, what good art, good things can be produced. Absolutely. It's interesting. Right back there. Uh, the question is about the Theater Development Fund, TDF, which supports theaters, uh, some indirectly, some directly, and, and, and how does it fit in? Um, for us, when we produced Spoils of War on Broadway, it was a, a way to have audiences come and see plays at a relatively low price. And it, it, to me, it's a great thing because it really diversifies the audience and people that can't afford to come to the theater really can afford to see your plays and get to know you and, and really hopefully spread the word of mouth. So it's been incredibly you know, important to us and I think especially as we try to get more young people into the theater and, and our prices are just skyrocketing because our expenses are skyrocketing and it's nice to know that there's still subsidized tickets. Yeah, I agree. 
on that? Take one I think maybe we should take two more questions and that'll be it. Okay. Here's the uh, question that we were going to try and avoid this evening <laughs> about uh, theater criticism and do the critics have too much power? Do you want to? <laughs> no, you go ahead, Wayne. Okay. I'll tell you, it's interesting because I've been talking around the country a lot this year and talking to college students and stuff, and they always, the question of theater criticism always comes up. And I was even on the Donahue show this year, and it was uh, me and Bobby Morse and Cliff Robertson and the critic from Time Magazine. And I noticed that the lights went up, and the first thing Donahue did was read from a bad review of the Heidi Chronicles, turned to me and say, Wendy, how does that make you feel? <laughs> Which was a pretty hard thing to do, but I think, I think we really have to remember as people who work in the theater, people who go to the theater, that the plays, like the Heidi Chronicles, can take two years to write. You have to cast them, you have to produce them, you have to go through the technique. It's not about the one night that the critics come there. And also, audiences at the, finally come to plays because of word of mouth. Uh, they will come because they like the play and they will go home and say, I like this play, you really should come to it. The problem is keeping the play open long enough <laughs> for those audiences to get there. And that's when you start getting into theater criticism. Uh, and many of the theater critics are very good writers and very smart people. They do have an inordinate amount of power. And where the power really comes in is in theaters like Playwrights Horizons or The Second Stage, where a play to have an extended life has to move. So you can have, there are often plays that didn't get good reviews that have long commercial runs because of audience word of mouth and because the producers keep the play open up. Like this play, A Few Good Men, audiences seem to like it and it's run. It did not get a good review from the New York Times. The problem is, if you don't get a good review from the Times and you're at Playwrights Horizons for six weeks, you're out of there. Play isn't going to move. And that's terrible. It's almost like those that are the most, um, those are the plays that need support in many ways. I think that's true. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not a critic basher. I think that the people that are writing criticism are incredibly bright, but they, you know, they do have their own opinions, and it's not necessarily the opinion of everybody that sees the play. We did a play at our theater about, oh, three years ago, called The Kathy and Mo Show. And, um, and it came time to think about who should review this play. Not that you have the choice, of course, but, um, uh, the, the chief critic of the Times came in, and, and the, Kathy and Mo, we sat down and we talked to them and we said, look, you know, you're young, you're just starting out, we're really here to nurture this material. We don't need to bring in, the, you know, the chief critic from the New York Times. I mean, we just, wh why do that? But they insisted upon it. They really wanted it. I mean, I don't know why people are like that, but they, they really wanted it, and, and they really got it. <laughs> and um, it took them about two years to work on that piece of, that, on their material out of the city, uh, two years of touring all over the place before they could come back into the city and do it again. And that critic didn't review it. It was Mel Gussa who reviewed it and gave it a good review and it had a really long life. And I think it had its long life. It was, Mel's good review enabled it to have a start and then it was the word of mouth that really gave it its long life. And I think that, that Wendy's right, that it's really the word of mouth that's going to sell a play. Okay, one last question. How about a question from a man? Okay. Oh, this is a, uh, an interesting question that Wendy's grappling with, I'm sure, every day. Um, has success affected how she's writing now? <laughs> well, you do. I mean, there are more in a way, you know, you get asked to speak places or, you know, like being here tonight. <laughs> and you do, there are more interruptions in life. I'll never forget last summer, I got a call from the Times asking me what my fashion forecast was for the fall. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I actually said to them, have you ever seen me? I, and, uh, and they said, well, we want to know. So I, I, didn't, I, really, I didn't know what to say. And I said, purple, wear purple. <laughs> and the next thing I knew in September, there was the Times fashion forecast and there was a picture of like, you know, Diana Vreeland and Carolyn Rome and, you know, people who care about fashion and me saying wear purple. So, you know, in, in that way, your life, do, your life changes, you know, your, uh, that changes. Um, and I think, you know, there's certain expectations too. You know, there's the sort of thing, gee, you won the Pulitzer Prize, how could you write an article about manicures? Well, you know, I think more and more, more Pulitzer Prize winners should get manicures. <laughs> um, that would be good. Um, but in terms of writing, I know that, you know, for myself, what I've got to go do is go isolate myself and write and not pick up the phone and be alone and not think this is an important play, you are blah, 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 and just write the play. And uh, if I can do that, I think it's going to be fine. Um, you know, and use it all, the prizes or whatever is a positive thing. So on days when I'm really feeling low, you know, think, I remember when I won the Pulitzer, actually my friend Marsha Norman, who wrote Night Mother and is a wonderful writer, left me a message and she said, uh, Wendy, it's a rock and it's something you can always hold on to. And, you know, next time I think, gee, I can't write or whatever, I can think about that in a good way. And next time my mother calls, I can also think <laughs> of that. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. <laughs>